So maximize because we are now talking about uh, you know cloud. Cloud is here and here to stay, and it's obvious. And, and now it's all about the business and business implications of uh, of cloud. And in this panel, uh, and the, the panelists will introduce themselves in a, in a second. Uh, we want to talk about building a smart SaaS company. So all the companies here, I'm sure that uh, all of you know them. Uh, and we'll start by introducing the uh, the panelists. So Sam. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Sam Boonin. I'm the VP of Products at Zendesk. And I'm Dennis Reno, Vice President of Customer Success for New Relic. My name is Stephanie Schatz. I'm the SVP of Sales and Customer Success at Xamarin. And hi, I'm Josh Rickow. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management at Jive Software. Yeah, so before we start, we want all to congratulate Sam for a great IPO of yep. Zendesk last Thursday. So. <laughs> And, and, and I think it's a very good point in time in which, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that the, the, these new companies that were born in the past, what, five to seven years, more, more or less, I don't know, when, when was Jive started? Jive started like ago? a dozen years ago, yeah, but I think been more in the public eye, let's say, for the last five to seven. Yeah, so, so I think with, you know, two companies here are already public and, and two companies that are growing very, very fast and will probably become public at some point. Um, we would want to talk a little bit more about uh, what is different and what is really a smart, uh, smart SaaS company or a smart company in general. And, uh, you know, if we are able in this uh, session to, um, to understand what are the top three uh, differences in software companies these days than what it used to be in, in, in the past, and, and not at a very kind of high level of we need to care about the customers or, you know, high-level messages. Let's try to be a little bit more specific. I invite the audience, uh, you know, if you have questions, ask, just raise your hands and, and we'll incorporate those questions into the, into the panel. So let's, let's start with this very high-level question. So what's, uh, what's the secret sauce of a uh, fast-growing company these days, uh, Sam? Um, I don't know if I know the secret sauce. Um, I know that, uh, it, at least in Zen's business, we provide uh, customer support software, which has been around as long as software has been around. Um, I don't think we do anything incredibly innovative from a feature standpoint, but what's different is that um, everything happens inside of the product. The way that it's marketed and sold and upgraded and used, and we actually use our product to do all those things. So um, Seth Godin used to say, don't leave marketing to the marketing department as an expression. What we see is that how do we get our product to do everything because you know, that's what makes Google worth a bazillion dollars, right? Is that the Google does everything. You can, you can buy, use, expand everything without talking to humans. So one thing that, that we've seen that's different is that um, we can take the same technology and distribute it to a lot more companies a lot more efficiently by using our product. So that's a, been a huge difference in the last couple of years. Dennis. You know, at New Relic, we're a relatively new technology in either application performance management or now we refer ourselves to being in the software analytics market. And so a new technology, we hear from our customers, they get tired of sort of the traditional software business where everything was so difficult to install and very difficult to upgrade and very expensive. And our customers want everything simple, easy to use, and that includes service has to be very, very simple and easy to use. And we also see from our customers a demand for more personalization. They want us to know more and more about their company, about the business they're in, and they also want to choose how they interact with us. So, so before we move to Stephanie, maybe a follow-up question to you, Dennis. Uh, you guys are now talking a lot about, uh, about, about data. How, how is data and product uh, makes, makes you a smart or faster growing company? What, what, what's the, you know, why has it become so important these days? Well, you know, and, and for those of you either in the Bay Area or in the New York Metro, you may have seen our billboards that say, you know, we are all data nerds is sort of our company's tagline. And we see there's just this increasing demand for data. And companies want to be able to make intelligent business decisions and they want to make them quickly and they want to make them on good solid data. And so our product and our service brings data to our customers that they've never seen before and that they didn't have easy access to. And so what we hear from customers is they want to be able to make intelligent business decisions that is all data driven. So, so Stephanie, uh, data, product, why is that all of a sudden so important? Well, I think um, for a company that is growing very, very fast, it has become essential to really understand our customers. Xamarin is a, as a company, we have a platform for mobile development and mobile testing. So that's obviously a very, very fast growing space uh, already by definition. Every, every company is going mobile right now. 
So for us, it has become crucial to really understand our customers and understand the moment when we create value for our customers. So if you look at somebody who buys our product, we actually don't have them as a customer. They have simply stated the intention that they want to become our customer. They've spent some money. We really have them when we have created value for them. So I call that the customer conversion point. And I think it's important for every company to define very clearly what is your customer's conversion point. Um, and then, in my opinion, the renewal actually happens in the first three months. Um. Josh, so you're in Jive, 12 years, but I, th I think what's interesting in Jive is that you guys have started as a traditional software company right. and transitioned into a uh, SaaS company by a little bit before you became public, but uh, so what do you see? I mean, you have both perspective in a single company. What, what is really different? Yeah, well, and I think that's what you say is exactly right, right? So Jive still has a lot of more traditional uh, customers where they bought it, they installed it, and all that sort of thing. Um, but what we're finding is actually, you know, the, the long upgrade cycles, like all those sorts of things that are associated with traditional enterprise software um, are a huge pain, right? And so this idea of SaaS and the idea that Jive was able to, to transform to delivering our product um, in a SaaS model has been critical, you know, for the, the success of our customers. And, and what we see are the ones that finally do take that leap moving away from managing it themselves to, to letting us manage it for them um, and, and use our cloud. Uh, are a lot happier, right? They're getting features a lot faster. They're, they're having all the, all the latest stuff. Um, all of that said, so I think that's sort of part of the Jive story, but I did want to mention the, you know, the data aspect uh, that, that you're talking about that, um, you know, so Jive, right, we're a social network um, for, for enterprises. The, the idea that you can now pay attention to how your um, employees are, are collaborating together, understanding if departments are talking to one another like and how they are. That kind of data brings all kinds of amazing new insight into how your business is functioning, right? And how, or in some cases, as was talked about earlier, dysfunctioning, right? Um, and so that's another powerful thing. And I think a lot of that data is just because it's becoming available and the idea of processing it is, is so much more accessible. So, so would you guys say that it's because the cloud has enabled you know, single product that is managed centrally and, and you can control everything? Or is it because user expectations have changed? I mean, why, I, I mean, would a, for example, would a company that use old software model be successful in, in this day and age? Could it be a, you know, fast growing company? Or is it because something that, you know, within the customer user expectation, where is it coming from? I, I, think, I think that we, have, we, we do have a huge advantage because we do have a you know, single instance multi-tenant environment where all 40,000 of our customers are using essentially the same product and we have the data for all of that. Um, but um, um, from a customer's perspective, so I think that uh, it's, it, it is a little bit of a secret sauce for us. And if you look at our, at our business and a lot of other people's business, and you know, there's two parts to it. There's the initial part of our business, which is really trial to pay, whether it's a small customer, self-serving, or a medium or large customer that's going through a sales process, and then land and expand. Everybody talks about land and expand and you know, negative churn and make all your money on upsells and stuff, which is great. But both of those can be data-driven, right? When somebody's trying Zendesk, we see the data of usage, right? We don't have to only rely on are, there, are they answering our email marketing campaigns? Are they talking to our um, salespeople? Are they um, reaching out for support? But we can see what they're doing in the product and we can understand based on the data, you know, people who send five support tickets through their Zendesk convert at 4x the rate of other folks. We understand those things. And then similarly, when it comes to churn, renewals, upgrades, expansion, all that stuff, uh, it's great that we have relationships, but it's even nicer when we know how people are using it. And we can use that data to reach out and say, hey, I see that your response times, your ticket volume is going up, your response times are going down, how about some more agents? Which is great for us and self-serving for us, but it's actually good for the customers as well. So that's what sort of the traditional model can't necessarily compete with. And the nice thing is it's, it's good for us as software vendors, but it's good for our customers as well because they're desperate to know how they're doing. Right? They, don't, you know, they, they have no idea whether they're using the right features, supporting their customers in the right way, and, and that's where data is sort of immersive in, in everything that we kind of do. And I think another thing that has changed very much is that um, customers have a very different um, expectation. They have a much broader knowledge, much deeper knowledge on their alternatives. 
So somebody who is your customer, somebody who has purchased, they know exactly what they could be doing alternatively. So the moment they are not happy with your offering or your technology, they have a very quick um, option to just leave you. So I think that also has changed a lot for companies like us. Uh, Dennis, uh, if I know the, kind of the background story of, of the Relic, and I, I know a little bit, is that the, the same founders of the same company created an enterprise software company called Wiley, sold this to CA, and then started the same idea uh, and built New Relic, which is a, a completely different model. So besides the fact that you know, Wiley was enterprise software and New Relic is, is SaaS, what other uh, decisions or uh, I would say design philosophies have changed when you guys have decided that you're building a fast growing uh, a subscription business? I think there are a number of factors in, in, in some of the decision making to build New Relic. And uh, I think the, the center of it is two things, probably being a very, very customer centric business, that we get a lot of customer feedback and we build our product roadmap directly based on customer feedback. And the other one is very data driven, that we see a tremendous appetite for data that customers have never seen before. It was very, very difficult to access. And uh, you know, we, we look at our product as sort of like getting a little taste of crack, if you will. Our, our customers get a free trial, they see how much data they can get and how easy it is to see that, and then they become addicted to it. And they want more and more, and our products are designed to give them access to greater data that they've never seen before. And what do you guys do with data? I mean, internally, from, from the way you operate, how do you use data effectively? We, we use data to make decisions every single day about our marketing campaigns, about our customer success campaigns, how our customers use data. It sort of mirrors how we use data internally. And I think it just becomes very, very um, self-fulfilling, right? The, the, the prophecy continues to grow. We use data to drive our business, and we watch our customers do the same thing. And our customers are very interactive with us, asking us how we're using data internally, and how can we use that to give them best practices. So, so Josh, I, I think of this best practices, what, what do you say that uh, the level of communication or you know, uh, best practices, benchmark, whatever, whatever is being kind of I remember pitching to VCs four years ago, you know, when you wanted to pitch a SaaS company, you had to say, and how is it going to be different than this? Uh, we're going to have benchmarks and data that is across customers and so forth. I don't think many companies have done this so far. And I know that Zendesk has, you know, third year of benchmark or second year of benchmark? Third, right? Uh, third year, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's really kind of unique in advance. Um, how are you using data? I mean, what's, what's, uh, you're, you own data for Jive, I right? do own data for Jive. That, that's effectively my job. Uh, so search and analytics are the two things I, I spend most of my time on. And um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the sort of benchmarking stuff because that there's this huge appetite when you think about handing analytics and reports and that sort of thing to, to customers. There's a huge appetite for like, well, the, these numbers are fine, but like, how am I doing? Right, and, and that's a huge question, right? Is a thousand of whatever these things are that you're measuring, is that good? Is it bad? Like, where, where am I at? And so um, we are endeavoring to do that. We have a lot of, you know, basically connecting our customers to do best practices. We are working on a benchmarking program, although there's a lot of opt-in, opt-out sort of privacy issues to be managed in, in that sort of a thing. Um, and in general, what we're trying to do is put you know, a lot of this data into the hands of our customers. So again, Jive ends up often being a pretty large installation um, at, a, at a customer site. I shouldn't say installation, but you know, a, a large product footprint where hopefully everyone is using it. Um, and so therefore, at, the, at our customers, there are people who are keeping an eye on things, right? Trying to make sure everything's going well. Um, and we're handing them lots of reports about adoption, about usage, um, both to help them understand you know, how how it's going, but also to tie it really back for them to business value, to re-justify paying us annually, of course, is one of the things that we're incented to do. Um, but for them, a lot of times, it's a kind of a, a career-making choice to help transform a customer using social, and, and therefore, they want that data to understand what's going on to help justify their existence and claim victory. Right? So kind of just to kind of summarize this part of the conversation, we've talked a lot about, I think, a lot about enablement and importance of data and the fact that, you know, we can do as vendors other things. Uh, um, and uh, for those of you in the audience that haven't seen, we've uh, kind of, uh, at the last customer success summit of the Tango, we talked about six secrets for customer success. And the key was, the first one was, it's, it's all about the value for the customer. And I think from this conversation, the second one was user actions over over words, right? It's kind of looking at the data and what they do. 
But I, I'm trying to ask a very kind of, I have my own point of view, but, but to ask you, do you think customer relationship has changed? Right? Is, it, is it a different type of customer relationship or is it the same thing? Uh, what level of relationship are we talking about? Is it, you know, is it the first thing is you know, the golf and the wine or is it the first thing is uh, you know, value and drive? I mean, what's your point of view? My, mine is pretty obvious, but you know, what do you guys think? I personally think that, that the relationship has completely changed. Um, it used to be that your account manager 10 years ago, right, that, that's what it was, uh, would check in with you on a regular basis. Every three months you would expect that. Every other check-in that would be a dinner or a lunch at least uh, to go with that. And I think these days just checking in with a customer by itself, that creates zero value for the customer. That's almost wasting somebody's time. So I think just having these regular check-ins as they used to be, that's, that's, that's old-fashioned and almost sometimes insulting to a customer's very busy schedule. So I think what we need to know is when are good times where we can create value in a conversation? And honestly, that's two, two types of situations. Either something is going really well or something is not going well at all with a customer. They've just launched their first app, fantastic. We need to congratulate them. We should get in touch with the customer. <coughs> or they're struggling setting something up. We need to know about that and check in at that very moment um, in order to prevent them from potentially looking at other options. So, so, so how I do you do that? I mean, uh, not a technology, but, but kind of more of a how you organizationally uh, you know, focus yourselves around the customers, making sure that, you know, because it's harder, right? I mean, check-ins, you put yeah. this on the calendar, you, ha you can do two check-ins a day, then you need uh, 10 check-ins per week, 40 per, 40 per month per person, and when you get to the 41st, uh, 41st uh, check-in, you hire the second guy. I mean, but this is all kind of very, very different. It's very kind of mm -hmm. event-based and, you know, things that are outside of our control. So. How do you guys organize yourselves around uh, that? You know, we, it's funny you mentioned that. To, to, I'll take a step back and answer the last question. Are things changing? I think things are totally changing in the 415 and 650 and 408 area code, but not as much as we might think outside <laughs> of it. I was visiting a customer yesterday and not in one of those area codes, and it was a typical, um, we don't know about Zendesk. We don't know the value you're delivering. We think we've, moved, we've grown out of you. We're going to move to a more you know, mature company that fits our needs, and it was very much a... Um, typical like CIO, VP of IT perspective on things. And then what I was able to do yesterday uh, was number one, not punch him, which was hard. Um, <laughs> but number two was actually look at our data and say it's funny that you mention that because I see the history of your usage and I can see how you're using Zendesk and how your support is, how your customer satisfaction rating compares to your industry competitors, et cetera. I also see that you've, you know, you've been a customer of ours for 18 months and you've expanded in this way. And then I also have all of your survey results that you've given us. So we've given net promoter score surveys and I see that funny you think that you're, we're not good for you because you're actually, you have 37 of your support agents who are promoters of Zendesk according to the NPS survey, right? So the world's still the same. It's still people selling to people and still uh, the challenges that we face in software, but data is starting to creep in and then this concept of democratization, right? It, you know, the CIO may be the decision maker, but she might not be, right? It may be the actual users. I know almost everyone in the panel, we have real human beings, like the core user at Zendesk, we have like 200,000, 250,000, the number of agents, whatever the number is, and like 90% of them are support agents, not managers, not executives, not directors, they're agents, right? Same thing with New Relic, same thing with Xamarin, he deals with, with um, developers. So we're actually serving the real users, not necessarily the sort of decision makers. But it's, it's changing, but it's changing slower than we may think sometimes. And if I can add to that, at New Relic we see our customers want a more intimate relationship with us quite often. When you have that relationship where you're now talking about data about their business, that's very personal and they look to us for guidance. They're suddenly they see data they've never seen before and sometimes they get sheepish about asking, what do I do with this data or how do I analyze it? And we find ourselves being business coaches, telling, teaching them how to analyze business. And I think the other part of the relationship that's changing is our customers also want a relationship with other customers of New Relic. Right? They want to talk to other customers that are using our service and, and see what they're doing with that. And so the relationship goes from the customer to us and it expands out to other customers. And they really value the ability to network and interact with our other customers and our customer base. So, so you're basically saying, and I've heard this uh, from uh, um, 
uh, the guy who runs customer success at Yammer, and kind of in, he has a lot of, kind of very interesting saying. One of his customer success is all about keeping the promise for the customer. But I think basically what you're saying is Nuretic is not necessarily the most knowledgeable company when it comes to how to take advantage of Nuretic, right? There are other folks within the industry that are superstars that people want to. And they're using data in ways we haven't even thought of yet. And so our customers are really great about sharing that knowledge. And one of our taglines at our company is what we're proudly nerdy. And I think our developers relate to that. And there's this whole cult following about what people are doing with data and how are they're using it. And it becomes a really interesting community of people sharing experiences and, yeah, and best practices. And, and maybe you should also tell to my team here that CEOs should code, right? Because they don't allow me to do that. So <laughs> and you, so guys, you guys promote that, right? You have this. CEOs should code. Well. He does. Our, actually, our CEO does write code. He actually created our products every year. A couple of times a year, he goes on a retreat and actually writes code, which is coming up in a week or so. And he takes no email and no phone calls from the company, and he writes code. And the other thing I'll tell you, it's a, since we're very community-oriented, he very often pops into our community and answers customers' questions himself. And that creates a lot of buzz. And I'll tell you, if you're using community to, to promote your company and self-service, if you can get your executives to engage in that, they love that. And it's a unique touch point to our company that our CEO actually goes into um, our community and talks to our customers. Anyone else want to, uh, to kind of comment on how the conversation with the customers has, has well, changed? I would say, and I mean, I think it's been alluded to, right? But we know that the, the latest software products have lowered switching costs, right? Um, and this idea of sort of consumerization of IT and that, that sort of thing. It used to be all you had to do was convince the CIO, right? And then everyone else be damned, basically, right? Like, it didn't matter if they didn't like your software um, because the purchase decision had been made. You took a year to install it, and now you're stuck with it, right? So now switching costs are lower. The users are far more important, right? And so you're having a much more direct conversation with the people that are using it day to day, which I think is... Um, is critical, but it also then puts the, the onus back on us to make sure that the product continues to be good for them because the switching costs have lowered, like it's easy to jump to a, a different product in so many cases, um, that you don't have that same incumbency advantage that, that you used to, um, which means the products are better. Agreed. Um, but but I, I want to kind of touch on what you said, Sam, before. The fact that you know Silicon Valley has its own echo chamber, and we all think <laughs> that, uh, you know, what do we do about that? I mean, do you think it's, it's actually, uh, you can actually build a company differently these days? Do you think, um, if you have decided, I mean, we're, we're seeing also in Silicon Valley some companies that have this idea of very big sales forces and selling top down and kind of professional services and big implementation teams and so forth and so forth. You know, what, what's your point of view on that? Yeah, I think is the that product related? Maybe you know there are some products that are that should be sold that way, or well, it totally depends on. Um, I, I've 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 been in a number of different technology spaces. I spent some time in sort of traditional BI software, and you can't. It's harder to sell BI in the cloud in a trial to pay model. Um, some of our products are, you know, certainly. Um, I think all of our products are, are easier to start small with. So um, the, the echo chamber is us talking amongst ourselves about how great we are and how innovative we are. But the innovation that we're seeing, which I love doing, as you can see, um, uh, but the innovation is, is global and is happening. I mean, we, you know, well, Zendesk, we've been global uh, from day one. Uh, the founders are Danish. They moved here when they were four people in the company. And even in the early days, some of our earliest customers were around the world. And, you know, just because of the nature of the way we deliver software, we had people providing crowdsourced translations of Zendesk into like 30 or 40 different languages. Um, so that democratization is happening. Um, um, it varies by use case and by technology and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, we always want to get ahead of ourselves and figure out what, the, you know, you mentioned like three years ago it was benchmarking and now it's something else. And, Data is hot, you know. Data is the bell of the ball now, and everybody wants to, you know, show up at the prom with a, you know, with data, right? And <laughs> big data, and big bigger data. data, and you know, and, and maybe next year it'll be, you know, user experience and customer journey mapping or something like that. But um, I do think that the ch fundamental delivery model of software is changing and uh, and being democratized. Yeah, I agree, and I think with that, the way we do sales, marketing, business development, and customer success also has fundamentally changed. I think, um, so if you take Xamarin, we're, we're three years old, but we were very international from day one as well. We have 
paying customers in 120 countries. So very global from, from day one. Um, and so for me, that means that I need to have a really good understanding of what everybody's doing. Um, I can't just go visit Sydney and Singapore and London in a given week. That just doesn't you know, make sense from a pure um, you know, numbers perspective for a startup. And so I think from day one, putting in you know, standardized, top-notch sales um, infrastructure, <clears throat> starting with you know, great CRM, like Salesforce, fantastic marketing automation, a really solid customer success platform. And then, I mean, I have probably 12 or 15 sales tools today that I pay for every month, every year. Um, and that's interesting conversations around, is it worth that in the beginning or not? And I think that's the best decision we've made because um, it just enables you to get the data that you need to then make the smart decisions to scale. So um, I, I'm going to open the, the floor for questions from uh, uh, you people, so if you have any questions, just you know, let us know. All right, yeah, over there. Uh, there's a mic, mic coming your way, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering at what point do we run the risk of over automating how we interact with our customers? Um, I think we're well beyond that point, actually. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what we try to do, and, and I think we all struggle with it, right? Sign up for a trial of any of our products, and as great and wonderful we say we are, you're going to probably get spam with lots of emails, drip emails called from salespeople and stuff like that. It's something we struggle with. Um, um, one thing that I see companies do is to constantly audit the customer experience. Right to you know uh, what used to be called mystery shopping in the old days of retail to go in there and try to buy your own product and to try to get support in your own product or to try to go through some element like that and you'll see it you know it's you know you'll see wow you guys are sending me a whole lot of emails or you know four people are inviting me to the same webinar on the same topic in a slightly way so um, some of it's common sense that you know it's basically free to send an email, it's free to you know, call somebody on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that risk is already there. And I think you know, we're all, you know, I think a lot of people here, are, we're all software people, but we also are all customers of software. And we see that, that challenge that we're facing. So follow up on that. How do we become smarter on that? What's the, what's the magic? Because, because I think you know, everyone, uh, for example, an example that we had initially with marketing when our marketing folks were trying to send a group marketing email, it, it was always becoming very awkward. This kind of message that it's not clear who is it for. And we actually started to be very good at that once we kind of had a, a person in mind we sent to this person and another 10,000 as well. So Yeah, I mean, for, 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 for us, it just one example is in our trial experience. Um, we changed our nurture paths. Um, uh, to be more usage oriented. So like you signed up for a trial, awesome. You're 50 to 99 employees, awesome. But like, did you ever come back? Have you done anything? So do we nurture you based on who you, what reg form you filled out? Do we nurture you based on your actual product usage? And that was what was a big impact. So we're able to apply again, apply data to being a little bit smarter. So instead of saying, you know, guy, I see that you signed up for Zenith trial. Can I interest you in a phone call? I can say, Guy, I see that you've been trying to create your help center. You know, would you like me to help you do that? And the reason I know that is because of the data that I'm tracking, how I'm tracking you. And, and I would argue that like, social media and the uh, options that these people who maybe have a bad experience with you have to let you know are going to keep us from overdoing it, right? I mean, there, there's still all of these other opportunities to basically people still seek a genuine connection with people at some point in the process, even if it makes, you know, even if it's super easy along the way, they're still going to want to um, feel at least that you're being genuine, even if you're highly automated, right? And so I think there's, there's enough options to, to nip this in the bud, that, you know. That, and you think it's contrast? I mean, I, I, think, uh, I, think, I think authentic think... authentic communication and automation, is it, does it have to be one or the other? No, not at all. Uh, but I think if your automation makes you start sounding inauthentic, you'll hear about it. Right. And, and it's something to be extremely aware of. It's something that I talk about literally every single day. Um, and I think it starts with <clears throat> having one central point in the company that owns the customer. That, that has helped us a lot, me being sales and success. So there are no four people who will email the same customer. That will never happen. 
<clears throat> and another good point is, I think, we need to see every single download, that's a customer. Every single support case, that's a customer. So I actually don't even allow people to talk about <clears throat> this download or this case. It's always the customer, and when you interact with the person, you have their LinkedIn up on your screen. It's a customer, it's a person that's behind that, <clears throat> that's behind that email address. I think that's really, really important. And I, yeah. we, we also take advantage of social media, and, and I think our campaigns to reach out to our customers are constantly being tweaked, yeah. and we keep our eyes and ears on social media so that we can react quickly to what our customers are saying about our outreach. And you know, customers get very sensitive about that, and we try to respond to that accordingly, but I think social media can be your worst nightmare or your best friend, and we try to be very friendly with it, and we constantly listen to what our customers have to say about our outreach programs. Yeah. We know Patrick, he's doing some very good job. Usually they all want t-shirts from New Relic, so yeah. we... You've got great t-shirts, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we have a cult following of those, so. Yeah, and over there. So, uh, okay, sorry. Hi, several panelists have mentioned um, allocating additional resources to their customer relationship team. And besides um, just kind of anecdotal feedback, is there anything are there any specific metrics that you use to understand how many accounts one person can effectively handle while still giving that high level experience to your customers? Yeah, so just to kind of re repeat the question, what's the, what's the scaling factor here? How many, how many account owners versus number of customers to on one hand scale and grow fast, the other hand still be authentic and, and impactful with your customers? I'll tell you, I'm, I'm asked that question almost every day. And I, I don't think we have the secret sauce to that yet, but right now we break our market into three segments, which is enterprise, commercial or mid-market, and then small business. And our small business market, we have like a customer success manager, one in 10,000, and they do a lot of automated outreach, low touch, but a lot of push. And in the mid-market, it's about, right currently it's about one to about 250 to 500 customers. In enterprise, it's about one to 50. And if you need to quantify this based on uh, uh, portfolio value, what would you say, a person to how much ACV or ARR? Is, do you have the, the, the number? You know, currently, our enterprise customers, we look at them at about, um, about 150,000 per customer. And, and, but, but those numbers are changing on a daily basis. And I think right now we've, we are attracting so many very large enterprise customers. I can see very quickly we'll probably have a CSM assigned in some cases to just one customer because those customers are growing so rapidly once they start using New Relic. So I think our formula is gonna change and we have to constantly keep tweaking that based mm -hmm. on what the relationship the customer wants with us. I've also seen other customers who have like three and four CSMs assigned to one account. And so I, it just depends on, I think, how, how complex your product is and how, how your relationship is and interacting with them. We do a lot of coaching and training. Right now, I said it's like one to 30. I think it's gonna change about one to five on the enterprise side for us. Yeah, and ours is, um, again, we have pretty big installations, so our numbers, like the ratios are a lot lower. <coughs> and where we can, you know, we're turning to automation, right? Like data analysis, um, things like that to try to understand who it is that's doing fine and we want to learn from them and pass that along and then who it is that's struggling so we can go out and, and reach out to them. And I think those are the kinds of things you have to do to, to figure out the balance for your own uh, product or company. So yeah, my, my point of view, I think, uh, just to add to my comment is, uh, and I've seen um, a very good presentation from uh, CEO of uh, Twilio, um, Jeff. Jeff Lawson. Jeff Lawson, sorry. Um, and I think his point of view was, are we really a software company or not, right? Are we all executive of a software company? Because a software company by its nature, and Dave and I talked about this yesterday, Dave Key, a software company by its nature is a company that builds and automates a single experience and then, uh, and then scales this uh, further. So anytime we're putting people as the bottleneck for, for scalability, we're actually not operating very efficiently as a, as a software company. So everything that we can do to do that, uh, including automation, including some mishaps in automation, is something that we should do. It th doesn't need to be uh, in, um, instead of authentic or instead of value. Value needs to come first, but uh, we need to think uh, how we scale this further. How do you do a global company? Uh, you know, hiring so many people, it's, it's just hard. Uh, what was the, what was the other question? Over there, sorry. Can you hear me? 
I'm just wondering, how's the sales team changing? Could you comment on this the sales team in terms of indirect field, and also are you hiring different types of salespeople? I'm happy to start <clears throat> on the first part of that question. I think sales um, um, has changed a lot, and I think um, when I think about my ideal salesperson today, that is a consultative, smart uh, person that understands the customer from day one. Um, I think when you look at um, a, a classic SaaS company, a smart, um, well-run SaaS company, we need to sell to the right customers. I don't care about getting as many customers as possible. I, I care about understanding what is the right profile of our customers and getting as many of those as possible so that we can own those customers over the next two, three, five, or ten years. So I don't want a, a coin-operated salesperson that just goes after any, any lead, any download. I need our salespeople to understand what our ideal customer looks like and then go after those accounts so that we have a relationship with these people over the next many years. Yeah, I think that's very different. Yeah, because people don't buy. They actually lease your software and they can always stop leasing it. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'm not in sales. Uh, I was once. Um, but uh, the biggest change I've seen, uh, it, it, similar to what Stephanie said, is that um, less PowerPoint, more product. Right? Um, you know, guiding customers through understanding your product and how to use it and the value that it delivers is so much more important and valuable than trying to craft a promise of what the software may deliver in the future. And that's hard for people who have, who have grown up. Uh, I grew up in the world of enterprise software, and that's a hard transition for folks like me to realize that, right? That trust the software and success using the software will lead to the business benefits that you're talking about. Um, the, the people that really impress me in sales are the ones, you know, the, the sales reps that can do their own demos, the sales reps that can um, manage an executive relationship or, or, or a buyer relationship, but also get down to the nitty gritty. Our, our head of sales who joined us about a year ago, um, you know, he's an EVP of a company where, you know, we're, uh, um, you know, pretty large 600 people. He still you know, geeks out, you know, even, you know, as his sales guy, he still geeks out and will jump on the product and show people in the product how to do things. And I think that's, that's a model of salespeople. I think that's really starting to be more, a lot more prevalent. The other thing I can add from New Relic's point of view is we see um, salespeople that are really successful are, are the ones who are also including customer success or service in the sales equation. So they talk about not only here's the great product and it's very sexy and it does all of this stuff and gives you data, but here's how we're gonna support you after you purchase. And here's our roadmap to make you successful. And I think the people who talk about the long-term success of the relationship, I see the ones who are very, very successful. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the idea of, of involving <laughs> services and, and whatever it takes to make you successful is important. Uh, Jive, we absolutely have what you would consider a traditional in fact, people who, who would have a point of pride of maybe making a sale without ever doing a demo, right? Um, who are also quite impressive when they can do that, but in a different sort of way. Um, and, and we're working hard to figure out how we can automate more of that on the, on the lower tier, right? Again, we, we often are selling it to pretty large enterprises, but would love to sell to smaller teams. There's, a, there's an inflection point where you know, a, a social product isn't necessarily critical for you if you're five people in the same office, right? You just go talk to each other. Um, but, uh, but we would like to see more of that automation shift and, and have those salespeople turn into more you know, consultants into like, here's why you would want this uh, kind of thing um, and, and broaden their reach. Yeah, and you guys have this, uh, we know because we've done this together, this uh, unique perspective of how you turn things around for the customer. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, and uh, yeah, as, long, as far as customer success goes, and we sort of talk about how you, you know, give advice and all that, what we've done, and we, we partnered with Tango to do this, and I, mentioned, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but um, for us, there are people on the ground trying to make this successful, and so what we've done is really um, put customer success to some extent in the hands of the customer, right? So we've, we've built a product out for them to help them manage their own installation of Jive to understand you know, what are people up to in there? How are they doing um, to roll out uh, through different uh, use cases um, to understand the business value that's being generated? Um, we do have customer success people in-house also, um, but it's really a, a balance of those people enabling the people at the customer um, and putting as much of that uh, in the hands of folks that are there on the ground every day so you don't have to have the monthly or whatever check-in call um, 
for the, the customer. You still check in with that person, but you know, much less often because they're empowered to, to do it themselves. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, I mean, I think this topic is uh, probably one of the hottest topics in Silicon Valley um, of you know how to build a smart SaaS company. So with so many companies like SAP and Oracle now trying to get into SaaS and so many of their executives leaving to go to SaaS companies, what would there be one piece of advice you would give them uh, about doing things differently in a SaaS company versus sort of the traditional on-prem uh, software world they might have come from? I can answer that since I came from Oracle and went to a SaaS company at New Relic. Um, you know, I had this burning desire also to, to, to go work for a, a, a SaaS company and also was interested in a company that was really customer centric, right? I built my career working with customers. And my advice was, you know, if you're going to look at moving to a cloud company, and especially a small one, find ones that have that commitment to customers being successful that's top down. If you have to build that customer centricity bottom up, I think that's much more difficult. But if the, the leaders of the company are really dedicated to making customers successful, that's the kind of company that I would saddle up to quickly. Which also means that, in my uh, kind of uh, interpretation, customer centric is product first, experience first, yes. value first. Yep, and, and the dollars will come. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So for us, our customers, our developers, our CTO opened our last uh, user conference um, with a very clear mission statement. Our mission statement is to delight developers. That's what we're all about. And everything else comes second. So whatever that might mean in terms of product, sales infrastructure, behavior from salespeople, it trickles down into the different divisions of the company and just changes the customer experience. And then I think a lot of happy customers, word of mouth, et cetera, at some point there's momentum and you'll grow fast. Uh, I think that's really important. I think we have, uh, we have time for one more question. Over there. Uh, thank you. My question's for Stephanie. Stephanie, early, earlier you were talking about um, how you're really trying to profile that ideal customer and, and you know, focus on them. We're, we're kind of coming to a similar conclusion that we want to kind of segment around needs instead of, the, uh, instead of the, the markets that they operate in. And I'm wondering if you can kind of share with me <coughs> a little bit about what you've learned along that process. I didn't understand the last uh, end of the sentence. Oh, if you could share with us some of your experiences and sort of going along that process and thinking through not necessarily what market segment are in, but you know, who are the people that have the specific need, um, whether that's an internal need or, or they're getting external forces around it. But, but you know, how do we identify those types of people? Yeah, it's so it's it's very complex, and I think that's a process that uh, we've started a while ago, and that will take us, you know, well into the future. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I think you, you do need to start segmentation with the different categories or types of markets you're in. So for us, that's a very wide variety of, from individual developers to um, small, medium businesses, mid-market, corporate, to very large Fortune 500 companies. And then I think um, the next thing is to understand typically what these people in the different um, types of scenarios need from us. And then, um, um, you know, first conversations with a customer, you always need to um, have your customer success manager able to really ask the right questions um, to understand what the project for the customer is all about, what really matters to them, what the different um, critical um, points in the project plan for the customer is, where things could go wrong or, or they could go really well. Um, and then really um, find the time to, to think into that process and to understand what this is all about. And then the um, challenge is document all of that, have a cadence that, um, that uh, revolves around that. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty complex um, methodology, I think, in itself that uh, merits a lot of focus from the executive team. I think often that's considered, well, the account managers figure those out, or the customer success managers today, they figure that out. I think uh, it deserves a lot of um, um, attention from, from the executive team. So, so I think kind of uh, I, I've learned a lot. Thank you all for uh, for coming. There was a lot of wisdom. I've heard that putting customer first is you know a, a fundamental uh, decision that the company needs to do if if it wants to be a, a fast growing SaaS company. And thinking from the value perspective, from the product, from the experience, 
and obviously learning all the time, data and innovating and continuously iterating. So um, thanks very much, Sam, Dennis, Stephanie, and, and Josh, and thank you all.